This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. It's three years until the next presidential election, but not too early to start handicapping it. Could it be the year for a woman president? Author Marianne Schnall thinks so. Democratic analyst Elaine K. Mark has some advice for Republicans. Start speaking to a majority of the American people. And Bill Press interviews Eleanor Smeal, president of the Fund for a Feminist Majority. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. A feminist author, Marianne Schnall, interviewed hundreds of women to find out what obstacles stand in the way of a female becoming president. The answer? Nothing. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, Marianne Schnall is a widely published writer and interviewer who is the founder and executive director of Feminist.com, which is a leading women's website and nonprofit organization. Her recent book is a series of interviews with prominent politicians and thought leaders. It's called, What Will It Take to Make a Woman President? Marianne Schnall, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Well, thank you, Jim, for having me. I'm happy to be here. And we're happy to have you as well. Now, at least one recent poll shows that the American public says it's ready for a woman president. Aside from the obstacles any candidate faces in winning election, what stands in the way of a female becoming president? Well, you know, after interviewing now over 50 wise and influential men and women of all stripes for this book, my personal sense is at this point, in my opinion, nothing is in the way. I think we are very ready to reach this next milestone, and there seems to be a lot of support and excitement around doing it, in the same way there was around electing Obama as the first African-American president. And my hope is that this book will make the case that we are very ready to break this next barrier. Do you think the president, President Obama being elected helps women this time around? I think just being able to start to see different type of leaders and start to just, I think there's a real um, appetite right now for greater diversity throughout, you know, our government and in all levels of society. So I think it does help to be able to see, you know, different faces up there in the higher levels of leadership. So I do think that it has helped. Sure. Now, do you and women you've interviewed believe that there is a bias against women at this point? Or is it just a matter that not enough women perhaps have risen through the the ranks yet? You know, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, a matter of being aware of what our biases are. So then we can, you know, correct them. But I think also as we have more women in leadership roles and in roles that have, you know, been traditionally male up to this point, it helps shift our culture and also eliminate some of those biases and even some of the biases that women themselves may have internalized about themselves. We're speaking with Marianne Schnall, founder and executive director of Feminist.com, also talking about her recent book, What Will It Take to Make a Woman President? Advocates like yourself make the point that Something is wrong with the fact that the United States ranks 77th in the world in the percentage of women in the national legislature. Would you like to see a system that some other countries have where where women are guaranteed a fair proportion of seats? You know, I think, you know, implementing quotas is always a tricky issue. And I know it also, you know, comes with mixed reactions. But I think there may be a lot of different ways to self-correct that can also work. There was a story that um, I I interviewed... um, in my book, um, Pat was the first female president of PBS, and you know she said was telling me the story where she was challenged by the board after her first five or six hires were all women. And Pat told, me, "quote I was challenged by a board member who said, quote Looks to me like you're running an affirmative action program for women." And I remember thinking, "Oh my gosh, is he right? Have I been?" Fortunately, I was able to say back, I think I'm running an affirmative action program for the very best candidates, but I'll keep that in mind because you don't want to ignore it completely. But here's the thing that I did differently. It was probably the first time that a CEO of PBS had ever said to a search executive, don't bring me any list unless there are women and minorities on that list. That's the difference. In fact, the search executive said to me, are you serious? And I said, I'm dead serious. I don't care what the job is. I want to interview the very best women and minorities you can find. 
So if you start there, then it's quite likely that you're going to end up with more hires that are women and minorities. So I think, like Pat's example, there are a lot of different creative approaches that m might work. I think it's just a matter of just having the intention to have more diversity. You know, when you look at you look around at television and advertising and just all the different things, and, and it reaches into all different media, of course, but it still seems to be a male world, male oriented, and 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 women are treated differently, and to me, in a lot of ways, negatively, and that would also be a hindrance to them advancing in something, say, say, is the world of politics. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I don't know no. if I don't I mean, I don't know if, if I think it's getting better, but I still think we have a long way to go. I think there is, though, a growing awareness. And I think that part of it is also that men are sort of becoming on, on board that just that, that this isn't necessarily seen through the lens as a, quote, women's issue anymore. I think that there's a growing awareness that sort of supporting um, women, um, empowering women and girls even throughout the, the world, um, you know, will help kind of a lot of issues that and problems that we're dealing with that, that were half of, you know, the population of this planet. And, you know, we, we bring valuable insights and perspective that we really need. So I think that, yes, there has been um, a lot of, you know, negativity around some of these, um, as we talked about with biases before. But I think that, you know, that's because this is, you know, in my interviews, a lot of people would talk, refer back to the fact that it was, you know, in 1920 when women first got the right to vote. You know, we've made a lot of progress and we're all kind of needing to change our consciousness around it. And, you know, that takes time and just awareness. But I think we're moving in the right direction. We're, again, we're speaking with Marianne Schnall, founder and, and executive director of Feminist.com. Uh, her book is called What Will It Take to Make a Woman President? Marianne, what do you make of the fact that despite the Democratic Party being so strong on women's rights issues, four out of the five women governors in America are Republicans? You know, in my personal non-expert opinion, there's no specific reason that I can think of for that outcome. It may just be how things happened in those states. Um, and it, even it should also be noted that out of 20 women currently serving in the Senate, there are 16 Democrats and only four Republicans. But, you know, ultimately, I don't want to get ca caught up in this as sort of a competition or a numbers game between Democratic and Republican women. One thing I'm really hoping to underscore in my book is that this is not a political or partisan issue. We all benefit from a diversity of leadership, regardless of political affiliation, and need to have more women serving in both parties. Okay, well... I I'm not done dragging you down that road, though. <laughs> so uh, along the lines of the last question, is it worth defeating Democratic men who treat women badly? And I'm thinking of Kennedy, Filner, Wiener, Spitzer. There's probably a much longer list. If they vote the right way on women's issues? Well, you know, again, without sort of turning this into kind of, you know, us versus them, yeah. I just feel in general, men and women should treat each other with respect. And I think part of a culture chain means not accepting bad behavior from any public of official, man, woman, or, you know, otherwise, which is where it, it really lies on voters to become educated about the candidates and speak with their votes, you know, according to their own personal values and their political beliefs and their own personal criteria. Would a woman president bring a different set of political and leadership skills than a man? Well, the, by the way, that was a very interesting question. I got a lot of different perspectives in the book. I mean, first of all, there's no question that men and women are biologically built differently. But I really think that leadership styles differ from person to person. If, even if you just think of our most recent presidents from Bush to Clinton to Obama, yes, they're all men, but obviously they are so, you know, so different. Um, however... When I think about this, I think, you know, as Gloria Steinem told me, this was a quote from our interview, it's probable that walking around female for 20 years or 50 years in this culture has given someone a set of experiences that men don't necessarily have. In the same way that walking around as a black person or a Hispanic person or a gay person gives people a different set of experience than a white heterosexual person. Experience is everything. Somebody who has experienced something is more expert at it than the experts. We need politicians who look like the country. So, you know, as Gloria said, I think from that perspective, 
women just would naturally bring their own set of experiences and wisdom to their leadership and, you know, help reflect the true diversity of this country, which is, you know, after all, what makes a democracy. Absolutely. Marianne Schnall is the founder and executive director of Feminist.com. The book is called What Will It Take to Make a Woman President? Marianne, thank you so much for your time with us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. We look forward to having you back and talking with you again soon. Thank you. I appreciate being here. You're quite welcome. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for Stand Up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Democratic strategist Elaine Kmark has been looking at the Republican Party and has some optimistic news. The Republicans are getting older and Democrats are getting younger. And we'll talk to her about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. One of the stupidest bits of conventional wisdom popping out of Washington these days is that whatever opinion you have about far-right Tea Party extremist Ted Cruz you have to concede that he's, quote, smart. Really? Bull goose goofiness and reckless self-absorption is smart? After all, smart is as smart does, and plenty of hotshots with big IQs have turned out to be seriously stupid, not to mention narcissistic, ridiculous, delusional, destructive, corrupt, psychopathic, and criminal. Take Joe McCarthy, Al Capone, Richard Nixon, Bernie Madoff, and the Koch brothers, and now down to Ted. Not only has Cruz mounted a maniacal crusade to kill Obamacare at all costs, but he sees himself as monumentally heroic, even asserting that his recent petulant shutdown of our nation's government was the moral equivalent of the people who fought in World War II to stop Hitler. Wow, that is grandiosely stupid. Moreover, Cruz splattered his vainglorious stupidity all over his own party. We're now seeing the spectacle of GOP lawmakers bellowing like crazy Cruzites, openly declaring their best idea on health care reform, indeed their only idea, is to kill reform. I can hardly wait for their 2014 campaign ads. Hi, I'm Congressman Goober, and I've been fighting ferociously in Washington to keep you and your family from getting the health care you need. Remember, vote for the Goober. This is Jim Hightower saying, Cruz, of course, can't even see his stupidity, for the Tea Party fringe has lifted him high atop its national political pedestal, dazzling him with impassioned pleas for him to run for president. However, it would be smart of Ted to recall that this same wobbly pedestal was most recently occupied by the likes of Michelle Bachman, Rick Santorum, and Donnie Trump, all of whom were also legends in their own minds. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. A year from the midterm congressional elections, Democratic analyst Elaine K. Mark notes that there's nothing permanent about a majority in the House in the face of large demographic trends. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Back in 1989, there was a manifesto written by centrist Democrats William Galston and Elaine K. Mark, which was a sharp critique of their party for not recognizing the fundamental policy problems it had. Now they have revised that essay and applied it to the Republican Party. And our guest today is co-author Elaine K. Mark, now a senior lecturer at the Brookings Institution. Elaine, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Well, thank you for having me. You're quite welcome. And, you know, if if you were advising Republicans, and in effect you are, what advice would you have for how they can become competitive at the presidential level? 
Well, I think that they've done some things right and some things they have yet to do. Um, there are many Republican intellectuals and pundits and elected officials who are analyzing the problem correctly. They're saying the right things. They understand that the problem is they are not speaking to the broad majority of the American people and that they are perceived as out of touch and um, far more radical than most Americans are. And that is a particular problem for winning presidential elections. You can still do fairly well in gerrymandered congressional districts, but you can't win the presidency. Um, and so I think that there are some Republicans who've gotten the message and, and gotten the message correctly. What they're not doing is that they don't have an organization that can push the message and confront the base. Um, Bill Galston and I wrote that paper in 1989 under the auspices of the Democratic Leadership Council, which is, you know, now folded its doors, but that, that's fine. Um, the Democratic Leadership Council spent years magnifying essentially the message that was in our essay, The Politics of Evasion. And they recruited centrist Democrats. They talked about this to the base. We had fights with the base. Um, the, most people think that party unity is what's important. When a party is in trouble, unity is not what's important. Discussion and conflict is what's important because otherwise you're not really grappling with the future of the party. And, and they're not really doing that yet. Mm -hmm. What are the demographic and geographic hallmarks of today's Democratic Party, and how are they different than, say, 25, 30 years ago? Well, the geographic one is, starts with California. Um, 25 years ago, California started, you started presidential elections with California in the Republican uh, table. And it's not there anymore. California has become a solidly democratic state, mostly because of the actions of Republican Governor Pete Wilson, who is very anti-immigrant in a state that had a rapidly growing population of Latino immigrants. The second piece of it, the demographic piece, of course, is the Latino population. So as the Republican Party was becoming more and more anti-immigrant, um, it was having no electoral consequences. And the reason was that the Latino population tended to be a much younger population than the white population. So what we saw in 2012 is voters who had for many years been in kindergarten uh, or kindergartners suddenly were grown up and they were voting. And guess what? They were voting for Democrats. So we've had a geographic change with California um, and a second geographic change, by the way, with the addition of the northeast, uh, northeastern states and mid-Atlantic states to the Democratic, sort of safe Democratic bloc. And we've had a, 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 a substantial addition to the base of the party with a growing Latino vote. The third thing I would say about this is that the big difference is age. The Republican coalition is an aging coalition. The Democratic coalition is a younger coalition. And if you're looking to the future, you always want the young people, not the old people, for obvious reasons. Sure, sure. How would you say the Republican electorate has changed? Um, they are more white, more southern, and more rural. And that's why you they have they will still be able to retain some power in the House of Representatives, but it's why they are going to have trouble winning Senate seats and a lot of trouble winning presidential elections. We're speaking with Elaine uh, K. Mark, a senior lecturer at the Brookings Institution. You know, most people assume that the Republican lock on the, on the House of Representatives will continue for a while, but you say it's not inevitable. How can Democrats then take back the House and keep the Senate? Well, it is not inevitable. Um, the Democratic lock on the um, on the Congress ended in 1994, two years after Bill Clinton was elected. Um, when you have a demographic wave that is coming, um, you need it, it will not 
be harmless forever. And so right now the consensus is that the yeah, the demographics are pose problems for Republicans presidentially, but oh we'll keep the Congress. Not true. Those congressional districts that are represented by Tea Party people, by others, they will experience the same influx of Latinos from uh, other parts of the United States looking for economic opportunity, uh, going into their businesses. They will experience um, some growth in their young populations and their younger voters are going to be different than the older voters. Um, the older voters are going to uh, leave us soon, unfortunately, and um, they will change too. So there's nothing permanent about a congressional majority when they are confronting demographic trends. Has the middle of the electorate fundamentally shifted on economic and, and military issues in recent years? Well, on economic issues, it's kind of gone back and forth. I mean, Clinton took the Democratic Party and made it a much more business-friendly, job-friendly Democratic Party and trade-friendly Democratic Party, which was necessary to bring the party into the 21st century and into a global economy. Um, these days, uh, this is many years now since, um, I think that we've got a, we've, we're a little bit more suspicious of you know unfettered capitalism, and I think the center is hostile to Wall Street, suspicious of big money and big corporations, and the and so the center is probably a little bit more left than it used to be thanks to the Great Recession, although by and large they still blame that on George Bush. Right. <laughs> Um, they, I, I don't know why that made me laugh so much, but it did. Um, when, when President Obama is no longer on the ticket, uh, will the Republican voter become less extreme and consider the actual economic policies of another Democrat? In other words, is he the reason there are no Republican moderates? Because it feels that now, way. It, yeah, you know, the, the problem with analyzing President Obama is that and how people feel about him is that you just you just can't figure out how much racism there is below the surface. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, with Clinton, there was a lot of hostility. OK, I must say there was a lot of hostility. Um, Gingrich took over the Congress. The contract on America was pretty Extreme. We call it the contract on America. Um, you know, they called it the contract with America. Right. Um, you know, but so, I mean, you, you know, it, it was pretty extreme. I don't know why these the Tea Partiers are so incredibly hostile to Obama, although, you know, the Newt Gingrich class that came in in 94, they closed down the government and then they tried to impeach Bill Clinton. So they didn't like him much one bit either, and he wasn't black. So, again, it, it's sort of hard to distinguish, you know, is there racism going on here? Is this the reason for the intensity of the dislike? Or is this basically we've seen this movie before and, you know, and it really doesn't have a racist base? Well, you know, the other thing, too, I about the, the – well, But, you know, the other thing about the Clinton period, though, is that you – know, Everybody was making money just throwing darts at a at you know at a at a uh, at a stock listing, yeah. right? I mean, so economically, yeah. we were in a heck of a lot better shape than we have been since the this current president uh, first we were, took office. Yeah. So I, you yeah, know, that's I, probably probably has something. It probably has something to do. Probably has something to do with that. Clinton had a very very favorable economy. Yeah. For yeah. both of his terms, I mean, almost. I mean, almost full employment. Right, right. Uh, it probably as close as you, as we're, we'll ever see. Um, probably as close as we'll see for a while. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. What are your thoughts about Hillary? Is she a lock for the nomination and the election? Should she choose to go that route? It's it's hard to say. I would think so, just because she is by far and away, you know, the most admired person in the party, and she certainly has the gravitas to be president. Um, 
So I think she probably is for the nomination. Um, and given the reluctance of the Republicans to sort of engage in the hard work of party building, which we talked about earlier, um, I would say that she, she could probably win an election uh, as well. So I, I'd say chances are pretty good. But, you know, a lot of things happen. And, um, you know, who knows if she'll end up running after all. Okay. Uh, Elaine K. Mark, senior lecturer at the Brookings Institution. She was the co-author of a 1989 manifesto along with uh, Democrat William Galston. It was a sharp critique of the Democratic Party, and they revised that essay and applied it to the Republican Party and joined us here today to talk about that on americasdemocrats.org. Elaine, thank you so much for your time. We look forward to having you back sometime soon. Great. Thanks so much. You're quite Bye-bye. welcome. Bye-bye. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press and his guest, Eleanor Smeal, president of the Fund for a Feminist Majority. Join me in welcoming a good friend of the program, a great leader for uh, progressive issues, feminist issues in this country. Eleanor Smeal is president of the Majority, founder and president, I guess I should say. Hi, Ellie. Great to see you. Good seeing you, Bill. Thanks for coming in again. We've been at this a long time, you, you know, haven't it. we? Yeah, <laughs> we're keeping on fighting. <laughs> fighting the good Fighting the good fight, uh, indeed. And our team is here, as always, Peter Ogburn leading it up. Hey, hey, hey. With Alicia Cruz on the phones. Uh, and, uh-oh, uh, Cyprian Bolding. Oh, you go. There he is. Yes, he here. is in full Cyprian costume. Cyprian is the only one who was coming in full costume today. Oh, then. my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think he looks like Whoopi Goldberg. I'm not That's sure right. who he's trying to be here this morning. <laughs> and you, you have know, to watch today. Yeah, it's a big day today, but it was a bigger day yesterday in Boston. Yep, they went from worst to first, wrapping it up last night. Here's the final call. In that game, um, uh, Dave O'Brien is his name. Dave O'Brien on WEEI up in Boston. Koji ready. He turns on the rubber. The 2-2 home. Swing and a miss. He struck him out. The 2013 Red Sox are the world champions. And Boston strong. Bedlam at Fenway Park as the Red Sox (laughs) clinch the World Series at Fenway for the first time in 95 years. Sports announcers get to have all the fun. They just I know. <laughs> they do. By the way, I, I had to pull it because I pulled a clip since we last talked about this. This is yeah. great because David Ortiz was named MVP. MVP. Big yeah. Poppy. Right, r- rightfully so. H- yeah. Had a legendary postseason. So you remember the last time that he was in the headlines was after the Boston bombings. And when the Red Sox played, he came out and said, this is our effing city that went unbleeped on a lot of stations. So last night, after they won, he grabbed the microphone and said, This is our city! (laughs) (laughs) Which is great. Oh, that is great. Boy, what a a classic guy. 95 years. Yeah, it's incredible. 95 years ago. They, no wonder they won. Kerry said, <laughs> Secretary of State Kerry said it was a big deal. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and they that was that was when they won the World Series the last time. And My after God. last season, they were the worst in the They're the worst team in baseball in, in, in team in baseball and World Series champs this year. It's just phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, phenomenal story. It really is. Oh. Ellie Smeal Hill is uh, Smeal here with us this first half hour, and then the Reverend Barry Lynn. Oh, Barry's here. Uh, another great progressive from uh, head of Americans United for Church and St- for the separation of church and state will be along in the second half hour. But first, Peter brings this us up to date on the, the big stories of the day. Works. Yes, indeed. A few other quick stories. Speaking of the Red Sox, some people credit their successful season to their playoff beards. If you watched any of the World Series, yeah. you noticed that some of the players looked, frankly, they looked kind of homeless with their big facial <laughs> beards. Yeah, but the President Obama, he was in Boston yesterday afternoon, and he mentioned that the, the beards worked out so well for the Sox 
that maybe he should grow one. <laughs> However, he said, quote, I tried to grow a beard, but Michelle, she wasn't having it. So he wanted to grow one. She didn't want one. So they compromised and he didn't grow one. I think we know who's in charge. <laughs> yes, Ali, indeed. Huh? I don't want him to have a beard. No. I don't either. No. We say farewell to AI. Not American Idol, but Allen Iverson, the man that LeBron James once called pound for pound the best player ever in the NBA. He called it quits yesterday. It's been three years since he wore a jersey, so people might have already thought that he had retired. Iverson racked up 11 All-Star nods and an MVP award in 14 seasons. Over those seasons, he spent 12 of them as a Philadelphia 76er, Mm -hmm. which is where he retired last night. He is a great, great player. Just haven't seen him for a while. but Yeah, a yeah, phenomenal guy in his time. And one Houston family strikes gold. When an anonymous Houston, Texas man passed away, his family was clearing out his garage, and they found a 3,000-pound safe. When the family gave it to a friend to dispose of his scrap metal, the friend wanted to find out what was in the safe, so he took yeah. it to a locksmith. That locksmith spent 20 hours cracking the safe open, and when he opened it, he discovered two and a half million dollars worth of rare coins. Get out of here. Houston police got involved. They took the coins into custody temporarily, but then released the treasure back to the family. No word on if they plan on splitting that with the friend or the locksmith that got it open. Well, I would hope they would get a you know, They gave it away for something. scrap metal. Whoa. They told a friend, take this and get rid of it for scrap metal. They and didn't inside realize of it was two and a half that million. their father was a coin collector? I guess not. Oh I guess not. Two and a half million. Mm. Huh. I think I want to go back and look through my father's You're house again. Right? right? <laughs> <laughs> Leave no stone unturned. That's right. Maybe. So, Ellie, I'm so glad you're in today because... We talked before about the importance of this governor's race in Virginia, and Very now important. it's looming, right? It's Tuesday, and there's a lot at stake. Terry McAuliffe, Democrat versus Ken Cuccinelli, Republican. But Cuccinelli's not just a Republican. I mean, he's the extreme right Very of the party, extreme right? right. Oh, yeah. my goodness. What are some of the uh, issues? Every that, issue, almost. Well, well it's like uh, on abortion, he wants a total ban, even for rape and incest. He's the one that that railroad through the uh, trap law, which is going to, if it goes into effect uh, next year, would close most of the clinics in the state. He's uh, also passed through the legislature. Yeah, passed yeah. through the legislature, but but the board of health had voted for existing clinics to be grandfathered in because mm. uh, these rules are just ridiculous. You have to have uh, essentially a, a surgery center. And uh, anyway, he... This is similar to what they did in Texas, right, I guess, too, right? Right, but this yeah. is the, the catch, is that Cuccinelli, when they voted for it to be grandfathered in, he said that he wouldn't defend them, they might be sued, and he, he, he essentially bullied them into reversing their vote uh, single-handedly. Uh, but he's also for the uh, for the personhood amendment, which would outlaw some forms, most forms of birth control. Mm-hmm. Um, he's yeah, not just abortion, but yeah. birth control, contraception. Birth control. Yeah, this is the guy also on violence against women. There's no nothing on the woman's rights side that would be safe with him on the Violence Against Women Act. Only three attorney generals in the whole country would not sign a bipartisan letter urging its reauthorization. He, of course, would not sign it. He's not for equal pay, for equal work. He's, you know, he's uh, another one of those that won't say anything on it. Um, He's on gun control. My goodness, no gun control, essentially. Um, Immigration, he's led the fight. He he wants no no, um, benefits at all in any way for a non-documented worker. Um, In fact, he would like to change the 14th Amendment so that if you're born in the United States, you're not automatically a citizen. He wants you to have to have parents oh, who are poor. citizens. Yeah. Uh, a- anyway, it goes on. He's very extreme. Very extreme. And and yet, um, I mean, well, the poll at the beginning, of, there have been two polls this week, I guess yeah. what I was saying. And it, it's a little disturbing because the one poll, the Washington right. Post poll, said Terry McAuliffe, that was the headline, McAuliffe has a 12-point lead in Virginia. Right. But in the last couple of days, we've seen another poll come out that's a lot closer. Right. right? One, so. one just came out that's six points. Um, I, I really feel 
that people do not know how extreme this is, and that and the racist doesn't get enough attention. Remember, it's 2013. Uh, it's yeah. you know Northern Virginia, where a lot of the votes are. It, you essentially uh, have national television. There's not a feature on uh, just it. So it, it's worrisome. But what's wor- what's even worse, in my opinion, is there's three races, and one of them. For the attorney general. Uh, so you have governor, lieutenant governor, governor, right? And attorney general. Attorney general. Yeah. The attorney general is just as extreme. Uh, there's two marks in it. Mark Herring is the Democrat. He's for gun control. He's for uh, women's rights. Uh, very vigorous on and uh, reducing violence against women. Uh, he's uh, for gay marriage. Uh, it, essentially, he's a progressive but he, you know, he's earned his stripes. He's he's in the Senate, et cetera. His opponent, extreme, just as extreme a, as Cuccinelli, a Cuccinelli kind in of, every way. Yeah, yeah. And he's uh, openly opposed, for example, for uh, any kind of affirmative action for women or minority-owned businesses. Uh, these folks are all against uh, equal pay regulations or enforcing employment discrimination. Um, and what's uh, his name? The Republican? His name is also Mark. It's uh, uh, Obenshein. But uh, it's Mark Herring that's the yeah. important one. But then you have a lieutenant governor's race that is, I mean, I don't know how this guy got on the ballot. His name is, the Republican is Bishop Jackson, Bishop R.W. Jackson. E.W. Jackson. E.W. Because okay, some I people say it. you, Jackson. Oh. Yeah, right. <laughs> you. you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I yeah. mean, he is so extreme on every issue. The one that just dry, draws me over the, over the bend is his issue that just is just incredible is that he is worried that uh, yoga has a, a satanic nature. Yoga? Yoga. <laughs> how many millions of Americans are involved I mean, in how? Because somehow you creates a vacuum in your abdomen or midsection that the devil can enter. That the devil rushes in? Yeah. I'd yeah, and but you know, like on the attorney general guy, he's very extreme on. And uh, what was his? Oh, he actually introduced a law in the Senate, didn't pass, um, that if you have a miscarriage, the woman has to report it to the police, the lo- right? the police within yeah. twenty four hours. Right, right. And, and there was such a hue and cry, he he withdraws it. But that he even thinks like that. Yeah, and and what what was the reason why you have to report it to the police? Well, you got to find out if that was a miscarriage or an abortion. That's how anti-abortion he is. What, what are we going to do? Criminalize every miscarriage? Uh, aside from the the wrongness oh, of that as an idea, like as Terrible. a conservative, I mean, I can't imagine conservatives would buy into that. Well, conservatives that. always give the lip service to we don't want big government. We don't right, want government. right. Unless it, be, Unless until it becomes a woman's body or the bedroom, that, right? That's right. Psh, then they and want the government state. right standing alongside of every bed. Right. And, yeah. and, and it, talk about an invasion of privacy. It's just ridiculous. And when you think that 40 percent, it's about 40 percent of pregnancies end up in a miscarriage. It's a huge percentage. It's not a little thing. I mean, the, the, the whole thing is just so outrageous. Woman has enough to worry about if she's had a miscarriage. She's supposed to report it in 24 hours, and then what are they going to do? Now, now, here's the thing. This election, it is being held in Virginia, and isn't it, it is important. We have two Democratic senators in Virginia. We've got a Democratic governor. But it no, has, no, it, you have a Republican governor now. I'm sorry. If, if we get a Democratic yeah, governor, yeah. you know, that, then Virginia, is, I guess you can call it a blue state. But my point is this has ramifications. Absolutely. Nationwide, doesn't Absolutely. it? What happens here? Because if Cuccinelli were to win, oh. that would be a green light to governors around the country. All well, it's a, country. it's a it's a red light. I mean, it's a green light to any kind of ridiculous legislation you can think of against women. Oh, you can discuss. Or right. More than that, you can pass. Uh, but it's it, it would be a turn to the right wing extreme, extremism. But also, do you remember what happened in 2010? 2010, it was the 2009 Virginia elections that started to sweep to the Republicans. That's one when McDonald wins. Yeah, I, in my yeah. opinion, he wins by pretending to be a moderate. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, all these folks, they, they, they project no. a more moderate image during the election than where they are. Oh, yeah. And that's what Cuccinelli has tried to do, that's too. That's right. But, but for the last four years, we've seen the real Cuccinelli. Oh, the real Cuccinelli yeah. is extreme. And the same thing with McDonald. He tried to act like he was a moderate. He wasn't a moderate. So this is the, uh, the big governor's race here. We're talking about some of the issues at stake and also the significance of it and the importance of it mm-hmm. nationwide in terms of, I think, both for the Tea Party, because Ken right. Cuccinelli is a Tea Party, and for the Republican Party, because if mm-hmm. this is the direction they're going to go, uh, what does it mean? And they at, put up this most extreme ticket. They know what they did. This is I, a, all three of them are extreme Tea Party all people. All three. Absolutely. All three, the whole ticket, as far right as, as you, you can, can get. Go. Will it work? I'll learn a here from the Feminist Majority. Big governor's race in Virginia. We're talking about the implications of it and the national ramifications of it with Eleanor Smeal, president of the Feminist Majority. That's uh, feminist.org, where you can follow all the important well, issues. On I'm our, sorry? On our political stuff, it's feministmajority.org. Okay, feminist majority. Sorry, this is not correct. Feministmajority.org. Uh, I'll chastise our producer, Peter <laughs> Ogburn, for that. Very sorry for that. Uh, to follow all the political stuff, not only in Virginia, but around the country. And, you know, one of our uh, great affiliates is uh, AM 1350 in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where there's an important issue on the ballot right, right now. Very huh? big issue going to be on the November 19th ballot. It is a so special election. So it's not the election. first Tuesday. No. No. This, is, oh, this is a special election, which I'm very worried because when you put it on such an unusual day, it depresses voter turnout. Oh, of course. They, yes. They, they do it, it often uh, deliberately. That's right? what I believe. I mean, yeah. here you are, and it's uh, November 19th. It's an election. Uh, it's on a ban on abortion uh, at 20 or after weeks. And no exception for rape, no exceptions for incest or the health of the woman. And it's aimed at a, a clinic right there. Um, and But it has language in it that's very troubling. Uh, for uh, for women. Now, uh, uh, can the city can a city enact its own law on? Well, that's what they're trying. I mean, there is the Supreme Court decision. Let's not forget, that's right? right? Supreme- this is a clear violation of Roe v. Wade. Yeah, and it means there'll be litigation. But uh, but it is it interferes with a woman's decision and and doctors' decisions. Uh, and and as I said, the health of the mother. Is is in total danger, as well as you know, very troubling, very difficult pregnancies. I mean, that was one of the reasons for Roe v. Wade was to get away from this, but that yeah. state by state or now or you're county, going city by city. I was going to say, yeah, or county by county. Now we're going city by Cities city, by city, different regulations. I mean, right? It's, it's yeah. a Republican council, city council, and um, and and you have to worry now. Uh, I will be pushing, obviously, to get the vote out, but but basically, it has a very deceiving title. It's talking about fetal pain, which has, yeah. of course, never been proven. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it, it, it's a so, deceiving title and a complicated issue. So that's that special issue. Pay attention to a lot of our good and friends out in Albuquerque on vote November. Against. Vote <laughs> no on November 19th. Elvis Smeal, thanks for all your good work and your leadership you. on so many issues. Good luck in Virginia. This thanks for coming in. This is the Bill Press Show. That's all for AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Marianne Schnall, Elaine K. Mark, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For americasdemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to America's Democrats.